Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, today we're going to discuss about gas turbines and combined cycles. This is uh, the first lecture uh, we're going to deliver online. So I will appreciate if all of you uh, go through this lecture. And by the end of this lecture, please give me feedback by leaving a comment uh, either on the YouTube page. We will also have a live session after this. So uh, any difficulty or anything uh, which is difficult for you to understand, you can we can discuss it in the live session. Uh, probably we'll, we'll have it on Microsoft Teams. I believe all of you have already got your uh, accounts on Microsoft Teams. So we'll have a live session there. So let's start our lecture today. So first off, as, we, as you all know, we discussed the basic introduction of gas turbine power cycles, uh, where they are used. Uh, so we'll briefly go over or revise what we started before the midterm and we'll quickly glance through these 10 or 15 slides and then we'll start uh, the lecture delivery uh, back then. So uh, as you all know that gas turbines they are uh, they can be classified as an internal combustion engine. We started with different applications of gas turbines. They can be used in uh, aircraft propulsion primarily can be used, for example, in a turbojet, a turboshaft, the turboprop engines. Uh, we've got the turbofan uh, engines as well. So if you see here, we have uh, different types of engines uh, that are used in a gas turbine. These gas turbines are also used in marine propulsion. And they are also, uh, and they are also used in the uh, utility applications. So for utility applications they are primarily used for peak power generation as well as for some intermediate or sometimes for baseload applications but normally they are not used for baseload uh, applications and why they're not used for baseload so the reason why that the primary reason why they're not used is because they are uh, less efficient than the Rankine cycle. Uh, they're also incompatible with the solid fuels, but their primary advantages as we went through last time is that they are, they are cheaper and the, the reason why they're cheaper is because they are, uh, they have a small size and mass and they're able to deliver very in, in their, deliver power in a very short delivery time. So they're easier to install and easier to, uh, uh, easier to run. They're quick to run, they're smooth and flexible to run. So if we want quick power delivery and for a short period of time, for example, in case of peak power demands, uh, gas turbines are normally used for the supplying that electrical power. Uh, because in that case, we, we might not be wasting our money on you know, the Rankine cycle reheating and feed water heating stages. Uh, and additionally, they only use a range of liquid and gaseous fuels. Uh, why they cannot use solid fuels because we need a clean burning fuel uh, such as a liquid and gas uh, whereas Rankine cycle can use you know uh, all, all, all different kinds of fuels so but for gas turbines solid fuels will pose a threat to the turbine blade and also difficult to use solid fuels so it only uses the fluid based fuels and compared to reciprocating IC engines these gas turbines also obviously have higher power to uh, their weight ratio. Uh, so we discussed the schematic of this gas turbine. The, the first step, which uh, uh, where the process starts, this thermodynamic cycle starts, is where fresh air comes into this compressor. The air is compressed to a higher pressure and higher temperature. Uh, this compression is basically an isentropic or adiabatic process. So after this compression reaches stage two. From there, it goes into the combustion chamber where fuel is ignited with this air and combustion takes place ideally at constant pressure. And this uh, increases the temperature uh, of this uh, air. Now, ideally, this also takes place at constant pressure. So it reaches stage three at higher pressure where it enters the turbine. Now this turbine, uh, it produces the, it, uh, the, the, the gases, they expand in this turbine and as they expand, they will, rot they will uh, do some work on this turbine. Uh, some of the work will be utilized for the uh, network, which is we can use it for either producing electricity or we can also use, uh, as in this case for aircraft propulsion, we can use the exhaust 
uh, flew up high speed gases to propel the aircraft forward and the, the rest of the gases they are exhausted to the atmosphere. So this is an open cycle uh, gas turbine. As you can see the turbine is directly connected to the compressor. Uh, so the part of the energy of the turbine is utilized to run the compressor as well. So uh, we also discussed last time the different gas turbine configurations. For example, we discussed what is a direct open single shaft gas turbine. So in this, uh, it means the uh, open cycle means we, we have air coming in. So in open cycle, obviously the uh, fluid that we're going to use is, from, is, is air and it goes into the compressor, the combustion chamber does work on the turbine and it exhausts it to the atmosphere. It doesn't go back into the compressor. So fresh air always comes into the compressor. Uh, then the, we discussed the two shaft gas turbine in which the high pressure region and the low pressure region can be separated. We can also have a low pressure and high pressure stages of the compressor as well. Uh, this is primarily done to uh, have a variable uh, load so that this load can operate at different RPMs as required by the industrial applications. We also discussed the uh, uh, one thing is the direct open and one thing is the indirect open. So open means it's obviously open to the atmosphere so both are open uh, but the difference between direct and indirect is the heating mechanism that is given. So direct method means you have uh, your air comes into this combustion chamber where it, the heat is added directly and these hot gases they expand in the turbine uh, directly. Indirect means the heat is added via a heat exchanger. So your heat exchanger can extract heat from uh, another source. This can be a nuclear reactor, this can be another combustion chamber or this can also be a, a solar uh, collector which uh, generates enough heat so that this heat can provide the necessary energy to this incoming compressed air or, a, or another uh, fluid can also be used and this basically goes for uh, goes into the turbine for expansion and is exhausted into the atmosphere. So another, another configuration is the closed cycle. So closed cycle means that after it expands into the turbine the gas flows out of this uh, out of this chamber and then is re rerouted through a heat exchanger where the since this, temp this the temperature of this gas is still high uh, we need to cool this gas down so that it goes back to the inlet conditions of the uh, compressor so this cooling means we can either do a cooling via cooling air or water so in this mechanism we have a direct uh, uh, kind of mechanism because still the combustion chamber is there and we have a closed uh, cycle where uh, the, the gas is coming in they reroute back to the compressor. Uh, for indirect case again we can have a heat exchanger involved where the reactor is uh, it, it could be another kind of a reactor or heat source providing the heat energy and this fluid is rerouted back to the compressor this can be an indirect closed cycle. Uh, we also discussed the basic of basics of the ideal Brayton cycle. Uh, so in, if you can see in, on this TS diagram, it consists of two processes. The compression takes place in adiabatic uh, reversible, uh, which is the ideal case uh, compression. In the compressor, then there's a constant pressure. These two lines are constant pressure uh, lines. This is the higher pressure line and this one is the lower pressure line. So this is high pressure, uh, higher pressure and this heat addition takes place in the combustion chamber and from 3 to 4 the gases expand in the turbine and from 4 to 1 again it's a constant pressure heat rejection to the atmosphere. We discussed the power, uh, how do we get the power output from the turbine. So we've got the main power source which is the turbine obviously and as we discussed before that a part of the energy is utilized uh, directly from the turbine that is used for the running of the compressor. So the turbine and energy can be devised in terms of the work done per unit time which is obviously the power and that that power can be a change in enthalpies of the, uh, of the, of the turbine from the H3 to H4. So this being the higher enthalpy value and this being the 
lower enthalpy value you can subtract the higher energy or higher enthalpy from the uh, lower enthalpy so and specific enthalpy means per unit mass you can multiply the mass flow rate of the gas so m dot multiplied by h3 minus h4 will give you the uh, work done per unit time uh, we also know that this change in enthalpy equals to the uh, uh, this this constant specific heat multiplied by the change in the temperature that goes on from 3 to 4 uh, we discussed it last time that this integral so it depends on the type of gas that we can use so for example for monatomic gases uh, we can assume a direct correlation between t3 and t4 uh, so we can directly integrate from t3 minus t4 but for uh, heavier gases such as diatomic such as air and nitrogen uh, this uh, this CP value this this depends on temperature it has a direct link with temperature so for higher temperatures we will we'll have to input the accurate uh, equation for this but for the sake of sim sake of simplicity we can just use the same equation in our uh, in our chapter analysis so the ideal uh, Brayton cycle we for the ideal Brayton cycle let's discuss the two pressure ratios that we define so the pressure ratio P3 over P4 is from the, for the turbine and for the P2 or P1 so this is the higher pressure and lower pressure also this is the higher pressure and uh, lower pressure but since they lie on the same uh, constant pressure line ideally if they, if, if they are lying on the same constant pressure line so P2 equals to P3 and P1 is equals to uh, P4 ideally uh, and for an isentropic process we do know that this ratio that so temperature and pressure they are directly uh, related uh, the, the, so we, we know from the ideal gas laws but for an isentropic process this is uh, temperature divided by pressure raised to power k minus 1 over k so this is the ratio of the specific heats uh, so for example for t3 over t4 is equal to p3 by p4 raised to power k minus 1 over k now for the ideal Brayton cycle uh, we discussed how to get the work done for the turbine so that is MCP delta T which is mass flow rate multiplied by constant specific heat multiplied by the T3 minus T4 so for the turbine part is this one we can replace the uh, T4 temperature in this category uh, with RP and T3 so if we do that so simply replace these two we can get this expression for the work done for the turbine in terms of t3 and the pressure ratio and similarly for the compressor we can also have in terms of uh, t2 and 1 over the compression ratio for the compressor is to power k minus 1 over k so these two uh, uh, magnitudes they will basically explain the work done by the turbine and work done by the compressor per unit time so if you assume that both are equal since uh, if, if there are no pressure losses in the ideal condition uh, we, we can use the same value RP uh, uh, in this case and if we subtract the turbine work from the compressor work uh, we'll get our net net work rate so the net work rate that is the net power uh, we can get if we subtract the turbine from the uh, turbine work from the compressor work so this will be m dot cp t3 minus t2 uh, times 1 minus 1 over rp raised to power k minus 1 over k so this expression basically means that uh, we have this expression which is the mcp delta t so t3 minus t2 if you look at this figure here so this t3 minus t2 is this part over here so this is where the heat is being added into the into this uh, uh, cycle so that means that this part here is the heat addition uh, into the cycle and network divided by the heat addition gives you the cycles efficiency such so the cycles thermal efficiency so if this is the Q part right and this is the network done so obviously this part here will be the efficiency of the uh, of the cycle that's the thermal efficiency so 1 minus 1 over rp is for k minus 1 over k that's the cycle's thermal efficiency so <clears throat> now uh, so uh, 
we can see that this cycle thermal efficiency is dependent on the pressure ratio and the K value and does not depend on as much as the, uh, the, the temperature values, the T3 and T1. That's the maximum and minimum temperatures for the cycle. Uh, so, uh, so what about the specific work and specific power? So now let's start our lecture. Uh, so we, we, we were almost here last time. So uh, this means we, we have this expression, but we want to know how the work done per unit time is dependent on the uh, the, the temperature or different factors uh, that come in. So let's simplify this expression further. Uh, we will need the, t let's devise in terms of T2 if we want to remove this T2 and do in terms of T1 which is the initial uh, temperature and the maximum temperature of the cycle. So we can simply replace this T2 or T1 equals to RP raised to power K minus 1 over K. So if we replace this cycle, uh, if we replace uh, T2 in terms of T1, we get this equation, right? So T1 is part, P is part K minus 1 over K, and the rest of the equation is same. And further, uh, uh, multiplying in the brackets and simplifying, we can get the this, this equation as a final uh, equation. So this equation is specifies the work done, rather the net work done per unit mass flow rate uh, depends upon the uh, so it's, it's, it's a, it depends on these factors. So for example, let's say if I were to, uh, let's say if I were to fix uh, T1, uh, the pressure ratio, the K value, T3. So if fix all these uh, uh, variables and <coughs> the only variable that's, uh, that's left is the CP value. So if we can see directly that the work done per unit mass for it is a direct function of the uh, CP. So for example, if you have two uh, uh, gases, so you have helium and air, so the higher the CP value, the more work you'll be able to do uh, with, this, uh, with this gas. So the, it's, it's five times more work, that's uh, more work per unit mass as compared to the, uh, as compared to the air. Uh, obviously, helium is, 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 is a lot, you know, smaller than air, so it will have more the the, the mass flow rate, uh, and it, it also have the more number of stages in turn in the gas turbine. So, but it's able to produce five times more work for the same T1, T3, and pressure ratios uh, because only because of the uh, the CP value here. So if we compare for the fixed uh, temperature, we can see, let's say we fix now the uh, T1, we fix CP, everything is fixed. Uh, if we just see the value of K here, so higher K will produce uh, more amount of work. So in this case also, the helium, uh, which is, has a slightly higher uh, ratio of the specific heat than air, will also produce more work per unit mass compared to the uh, air. So that's, that's another thing we discussed. And lastly, we discussed the pressure ratio. So if we keep all other things constant, but the pressure ratio here is in two, uh, uh, two states. One is in the numerator, one is in the denominator. So if we plot this curve, we'll have the work done per unit mass against the pressure ratio. So we have the work done per unit mass against the pressure ratio. We have the initial, initially it's, uh, it's increasing as the pressure ratio increases, it reaches up to an optimum point and then starts to uh, decrease. So if we fix T1 and T3, for example, you see here the T3 is the max temperature uh, the material can withstand. So that's the metallurgical limit of the gas turbine. Uh, so T1 is most probably the atmospheric uh, atmospheric temperature conditions for air, that's for the open cycle. Uh, so T1 and T3 being fixed, the pressure ratio can be varied by uh, increasing. So this is the lowest pressure ratio. So this P3 or P2, uh, this pressure line is this one. If you can increase this pressure ratio to further to 0.2 and then further increase the pressure ratio to uh, 0.3 here. 
uh, as we increase the pressure ratio you can see the net work done is obviously going to be the uh, area under this curve so the area under so the area under this curve here is smaller as and the area under this curve is also smaller right so the only possible area that's the maximum area that you can have is an optimum area that's the uh, given by the middle point here the second uh, the second value here so that gives you the maximum work done per unit per unit mass so that gives you uh, this indicates that you can have an optimized pressure ratio so how to get this optimized uh, pressure ratio we can we can basically derivate this expression so we have this expression here so if we differentiate this expression this uh, net specific word with respect to the uh, pressure ratio and equate it to zero uh, we'll get the value of t2 from this expression so that t2 value comes as t1 t3 uh, square root so for this particular value it indicates it will it will give the a maximum possible work for this pressure ratio so for that and that's for the ideal Brayton cycle uh, so for example for one gas if you have the same pressure ratio that means the T2 or T1 equals to T3 by T4 uh, if you can replace uh, T2 uh, in this uh, if, if you can replace T1 and T3 in this expression so we get T2 equals to T4 which means that at this point where these two uh, with these two temperatures become equal uh, you will have the maximum uh, work done or the optimized work done at that pressure ratio so uh, so this t2 or t1 raised to power r p raised to power k minus 1 over k can be rewritten in terms of this uh, optimized value which we got for t2 which is t1 t3 square root uh, if we simply replace the T2 value uh, in this case with the T1 and T3 you will get obviously because this is square root over here so you will get uh, inverse so let's say if you want to get the pressure ratio out this expression K minus 1 over K will go to this side so it will be inverse of K minus 1 over K so that will be K over uh, K minus 1 because of the square root here we will have k over 2k minus 1 uh, so this value k over 2k minus 1 obviously it decreases if k is increased right so that means for a monatomic gas so it has a higher value of k it will have a lower optimum pressure ratio right so it will so when it has a lower optimum pressure ratio which means that at lower uh, pressure ratios it can produce the maximum work so it, it, it obviously means that it will help uh, reduction in the plant size uh, we can either have uh, it because it can operate at lower maximum pressure right so the maximum pressure it can, it can be lower or the lower pressure that means the lower pressure area in a closed cycle that can be increased to a higher value so it means either you can lower the maximum pressure or you can increase the low pressure for a closed cycle uh, gas so that means you can operate at lower pressure and it will uh, result in a reduction in the uh, plant size so let's do a uh, question uh, for this so we, we have a uh, the question states that we, can, we have to find the pressure ratio to produce 600 BTU per pound mass for helium and for air so CP value for and K value for both are given and you're given the initial temperature uh, T1 as 500 Rankin and maximum temperature that is the 3 3 value is also given to you as 2500 Rankin so if these two values are given and you're given the network uh, we know the equation for the network for the ideal cycle that's CP T1 and 1 minus RP is per K minus 1 over K plus T3 in the same expression uh, we can input the value so from from this uh, we know the CP we know the T1 we know the T3 value uh, we'll have to get only the 
our p-value here. So it's it's happening in two uh, two different places, and we also know the work done per unit uh, mass, the net work done, the rate of net work done per unit mass. So uh, to get these two values, <coughs> since we know everything else, uh, we can input or plug in the information and multiply the entire equation by uh, the same r p raised per k minus one over k. So if you multiply the entire equation by this uh, rp raised to power k minus 1 over k, that's this value is 0.3972, uh, you'll get a quadratic equation because this will multi if you multiply this, this will be uh, whole squared and some, some will be just one numerical uh, rp raised to power k minus 1 over k and some value will be just uh, a numerical value. So this quadratic equation, you can solve for this uh, so for for example for helium this value the ideal value comes out between 2.16 and 26.62 so it yields these two values where <clears throat> where 600 BTU per pound mass of work can be can be achieved uh, so uh, obviously it means that it will be a curve like this where uh, it's obviously let's say this is the 600 point so it's cutting at these two points here uh, and it will have an optimum value somewhere around the, the, the center point so somewhere around the center point it will have an optimum value so this optimum value will be in using the same equation that we derived earlier so it's t3 divided by t1 raised to power k over 2k minus 1 so if you plug in the values here you can get the optimum pressure ratio which is 7.58 and if you plug in this optimum pressure ratio back into the main equation and let's say you have all the other uh, you know all the other t1 t3 and cp values uh, you'll get the maximum work that's possible so we can do this process for both uh, helium and air so the result that we get is for helium you get the uh, max work as 954 uh, uh, and compared to the same it's the same work so this is BTU per pound mass uh, compared to the same for air uh, for 600 uh, BTU per pound mass you get RP as the imaginary value for the same quadratic equation so uh, why we are having the imaginary values uh, is because the numerical value for 600 here uh, if, if, if we have the root as imaginary it means that this amount of work done uh, that we have specified over here 600 BTU per pound mass with these conditions of temperature and with these conditions of the CP value and K value that we have uh, plugged in uh, it's just not possible to have the 600 BTU per pound mass so imaginary value means simply that uh, we cannot achieve this 600 uh, uh, BTU per pound mass using air and these temperature conditions, right? So obviously we'll need, if you want to achieve this uh, mass rate, we can increase the temperatures uh, to achieve this, right? Uh, and doing the same uh, optimum conditions, uh, the optimum pressure ratio for air comes out around 16.72. And at this optimum pressure ratio, we can obviously check uh, for this, these temperature conditions the maximum possible work done is 183 so this is a check uh, to ensure that obviously the 600 value we cannot achieve uh, in addition to this we can also get the maximum pressure ratio possible for these temperature conditions all you have to do is equate t3 and uh, t2 if we equate these two these two temperatures which means the uh, the, 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 the T3 and T2 they are both uh, equal temperatures uh, at that point we can achieve the maximum possible uh, pressure ratio and that is equals to uh, uh, for, for uh, helium it comes out around 57.5 and for air it comes out, um, comes out 279.6 if we see the graph for this uh, particular numerical uh, we can see that it reaches a maximum point here where the helium at the 7.58 reaches the maximum work which is 900 around something uh, BTU per pound mass and for air the maximum uh, uh, work is obviously around 180 which we discussed before 
Uh, but the efficiency of both cycles, obviously helium has a higher efficiency than air, uh, it, it increases with the pressure uh, ratio as, as the pressure is, in, is increasing. Uh, but you have to remember that this is for the ideal case only. Okay, so uh, next we're going to discuss the non-idealities in the Brayton cycle. So we, ha we, we do know that uh, so, so a thermodynamic cycle is obviously a series of processes, right? So for example, we are going from cycle number one to cycle number two, that's adiabatic compression. But in reality, there, obviously there's going to be some uh, uh, losses involved, particularly in this case, we have the fluid friction in the compressor, uh, which increases the entropy of the cycle. And instead of going uh, straight up, it will uh, it will have a higher temperature uh, compared to the previous uh, ideal state, and it will have a higher entropy from the second law of thermodynamics. So the uh, and the next stage is the constant pressure heat addition. So ideally, it should be going on this line, but in reality, because of the uh, pressure losses, the pressure drop during the heat addition, it will have a lower pressure than specified for the ideal case. Similarly, in the turbine, again, because of the fluid friction, it will not follow the isentropic uh, uh, expansion. It will increase both in temperature and it will increase both in entropy. So this increase means that it, will, it won't be an isentropic process, but rather the real process will look something like this from three to four. And again, from four to one, there again, the pressure drop during heat rejection will also result in uh, higher pressure. Uh, so it will eject at a higher pressure compared to the ideal pressure, which is, which is, which is in this line over here. So both the, the in, in initially it will uh, have a lower pressure uh, and, and during the, the heat addition, it will achieve a lower pressure as compared to the ideal state. And when it reaches out, it will have a higher pressure compared to the uh, ideal state. Uh, and then this is going to be rejected, heat is going to be rejected from four to uh, one. So that's the non-ideal uh, Brayton cycle. Uh, but for simplicity's simplicity sake, we, we consider, uh, let's just consider that these two uh, heat addition and heat rejection processes are ideal. Uh, so if we consider these two ideal cases, so we already know that T2S equals to T1 T3 square root. And for one gas and same pressure ratio, we've got uh, the pressure ratio equals to K minus one over K, which is equals to T2 over T1, which is equal to T3 over T4S. So for ideal uh, these conditions of T2S and T4S, uh, we get if these two temperatures are equal, right? So let's say if these two uh, temperatures are equal, 4S and, 2, uh, and 2S, we can almost achieve a maximum, uh, maximum power because this, that's the optimized point for us. So uh, for the isentropic processes of, of all of these, uh, we have the, as the, for the compressor, polytropic efficiency, which is because we're supplying uh, work to the compressor, the actual work is more as compared to the uh, ideal work. So the actual work will be in the denominator and ideal work will be in the numerator. So in this case, the ideal work is the isentropic works from one to two S. So you can have H2S minus H1 divided by the H2 minus H1, which is the actual work. Similarly for the turbine, because the turbine is supplying the, the, the work, right? So the actual work is less and the ideal work is going to be more. So the more work is going to be in the uh, denominator. So this actual work is going to be H3 minus H4 divided by H3 minus H4S. So that's the turbine's polytropic efficiency. Uh, and, the, and then finally, we have the net power of the cycle. So that means the turbine power minus the compressor power. Uh, so again, in this case, we can subtract these two, uh, 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 these two enthalpies, or we can also subtract from m dot cp uh, delta t for both turbine and compressor, considering the constant of specific is, uh, this is constant for both cases. Uh, we can replace uh, the, 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 the T4 and we can also replace the T2 uh, with 
with the uh, for example we have t3 minus t4 here we can replace uh, the, the t4 part with the uh, uh, with the actual 4s and we can also replace the t2s uh, so t, sorry t2 with the t2s from the uh, compressors as a polytropic efficiency so if we simply just replace these two uh, uh, expressions we can get in terms of the uh, polytropic efficiency of the turbine and in terms of the polytropic efficiency of the uh, compressor so we can use this equation uh, if we know the as in uh, the, the the efficiencies of both the turbine and the compressor and to get the net work done from that cycle uh, normally a compressor may take around 40 to 80 percent of the output of the turbine and a Rankine cycle if you compare the same for the Rankine cycle it takes around one to two percent uh, of, the, of the pumping work required to pump the liquid so as you see the difference is huge uh, and that's why the normally the, the gas turbine they operate around 30 percent or uh, of, of their efficiency whereas if you compare um, a Rankine cycle it's around 40 or 45 percent uh, working efficiency so uh, the next is the net power in terms of the isentropic efficiency so we already got this equation uh, we can also replace this in terms of the pressure ratio so we need to find out what's the link between the net power and the pressure ratio for this similar as we did for the last time so if you replace this pressure ratio uh, which is equals to T2s divided by T1 which is also equals to T3 by T4s since we are considering the no loss in the, uh, uh, in the heat addition and heat rejection stage uh, we can simply input this expression uh, back into the uh, we can replace T4s and uh, we can replace uh, uh, T2s in terms of uh, to, to remain in terms of T1 and T3 so we get this expression so I have the derivation in the next slide if you want to review it later uh, so this is expression we get so if you see the, the this part on the uh, this this part over here so this is the efficiency of the ideal Brayton cycle so 1 minus 1 over rp raised to power k minus 1 over k so that's the ideal Brayton cycle efficiency and this this part here is the rest of the equation which is uh, depicting uh, this, this 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 network the, the network or the net flow rate so again we can use the uh, so what's the amount of heat that's added between 2 and 3 so that's obviously m dot cp t3 minus uh, t2 that's the heat addition and that heat addition equals to uh, t3 minus if you replace again the t2 component with uh, 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 so it, if it gives you in terms of t1 and the pressure ratio uh, you can have this expression in terms of the the polytropic efficiency of the compressor and in terms of T1 so this is the expression you get for the heat addition so if you divide these two uh, the network done by the heat addition you get the uh, overall efficiency of the uh, cycle for a non-ideal uh, Brayton cycle so the non-ideal efficiency can then be found if we simply divide this by this expression so this is the derivation if you want uh, to have a closer look at how to get that expression this is just uh, playing with the uh, different variables and getting the answer at the end so let's not go into too much detail okay so uh, the, lastly we have the efficiency of the non-ideal uh, cycle so once we have the expression we know that the efficiency of the non-ideal Brayton cycle has a strong function or the rather strong relationship between the cycle temperatures that is the T1 and T3 so if you compare with the ideal uh, Brayton cycle uh, it was just dependent on the pressure ratios and the uh, K value the ratio of specific heat value but in case of the non ideal Brayton cycle it is uh, related to T1 and T3 and for each set of T1 and T3 there exists a certain uh, optimum pressure ratio so at that optimum pressure ratio which can give us the maximum power that can be extracted uh, but it, it has another point that uh, this is for the maximum power uh, but for the efficiency it will also have a different uh, pressure ratio 
So we will have in this, uh, in, in the case of a non-ideal uh, 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 Britain cycle, we've got two optimum pressure ratios. We will, will have to uh, see which, uh, which, which is the one which we want for, uh, let's say the specific power and which is the one uh, we want for the uh, efficiency. So we'll have, we'll have to choose between either specific power and efficiency and we'll have two optimum pressure ratios. So that depends on the design of uh, design requirements uh, of, 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 of the uh, gas turbine in this case. Uh, and lastly, we have the pressure losses. Uh, due to the pressure losses, we have, uh, so obviously we will not have the same compression ratio for, for both. We'll have different compression ratios. And we know that the P4, the turbine's exit pressure is going to be higher and P1, that is the uh, inlet pressure, that is going to be a lower uh, pressure. So if, if we have P3 by P4, which is the turbine pressure, uh, pressure ratio, and P2 by P1, which is the uh, compressor's uh, pressure ratio, uh, so P1 being the smaller value, so obviously the compressor ratio for the uh, compressor is going to be higher as compared to the pressure ratio for the turbine. So if, let's, let's, let's look at, uh, lastly, let's look at the, the efficiency and power of a simple non-ideal cycle for uh, a case study or an example here. We've got the, uh, the, the temperature. Uh, of this uh, in inlet temperature 15 degrees centigrade and we have the uh, P1 value which is a constant. We've got efficiency 90% and 87% for the turbine. Uh, the mechanical losses, uh, that means the auxiliary losses, the friction losses, there are in the bearings and shaft and uh, they are 1%. We've got uh, heat losses in combustion chamber, we've got some losses around 2%. And then there's an air bypass uh, loss. That's, uh, that's because not all of the air pass through, passes through the turbine. It passes through uh, the gaps between the housing and the turbine blades. So that's about 3% uh, air bypass loss. And also we have the uh, pressure losses. If you remember from, from the fluid mechanics course, uh, whenever a fluid flows through uh, constrictions or any, any, any place, there obviously there are pressure losses. So we've got pressure losses in inlet, uh, in combustion chamber, at outlet, uh, let's say we have a regenerator, we'll discuss this regenerator in the next uh, class. So these are all the losses uh, there are in each stage. So let's look at the graphs for efficiency versus the pressure ratio here. Uh, so this is efficiency on the y-axis and you've got the compressor's pressure ratio on the x-axis. Similarly, you've got the network done on the y-axis and the pressure ratio for the compressor on the x-axis. Uh, and the simple cycle is the uh, solid line and width regenerator is the dashed, uh, dashed line. So let's look at the simple cycle. Uh, if you see here, the, the graph uh, is di directly linked with the T3. That's the maximum temperature. So if you increase the max temperature, we can see that the efficiency of the cycle uh, improves. So that, that means that uh, that follows the Carnot cycles, uh, uh, the, 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 the example that higher the max temperature, the higher the efficiency we get. It's, it's, the trend is same for the work done. So more work is done, obviously, if you increase the max temperature. Next, if you see the link between efficiency and the pressure ratio, uh, that means that this curve is starting to bulge here and similarly with regenerate, it starts to go like this way. So it's, it means that it has an optimum value which, uh, at which it reaches the maximum efficiency in both cases. So for the work done also, the pressure ratio has an optimum value where it can perform the maximum work and maximum efficiency. Uh, but if you compare these two graphs, let's say for the simple cycle, the optimum pressure ratio uh, is greater for the efficiency uh, than it is for the work done. So for the efficiency part, we've got the optimum pressure ratio around, let's say, uh, 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 it's around 20 or even higher than this. But for the specific power, it's around you know, 10 to 15 uh, for, for these two or three temperature conditions. Uh, we can also see from this, this graph that, uh, so, so 
this optimum uh, so it's, uh, salt dependent so pressure ratio is also dependent on this so increasing the temperature will increase the work done increasing the temperature will increase the efficiency and you can compare these two graphs also that the value of the pressure ratios uh, also has a different value so it's obviously it's going to be a compromise between how much efficient you want a cycle to be and how much uh, work you want from a cycle uh, obviously lower efficiency means you'll have to input more fuel and you there will be a losses involved but it depends on what application you want to uh, use it for so uh, so that's it from this lecture uh, ne next class we'll study the modification of the Brayton cycles and uh, uh, we'll study what different uh, components we can add to the uh, gas turbine to improve its efficiency further uh, and what kind of different stages we can use to uh, further enhance its uh, efficiency and work output so uh, if you have any questions please uh, let me know uh, so that's the end of today's lecture uh, thank you very much